My name is Jason Wayman. I've uh, been with Siemens for uh, many years now. Started back in 2000, was actually a customer before then. So as we jump in, I like to typically start off just a little bit high level actually and remind people why they're actually uh, listening to Siemens present something. And keep in mind that, you know, Siemens, obviously, we're going to really drill into some very specific topics today related to noise and vibration style data acquisition. But we are part of a much larger infrastructure. I mean, Siemens itself has the accelerator platform that spans many, many of our businesses, be it from anything as far as manufacturing, product development. As we drill into this, the Siemens accelerator in the software world, the part is really in this Sim Center bucket, per se, if you will, where we talk about everything from structural fluids, thermal, et cetera. And then more specifically, really into the physical testing part of that. And if we look at all the different products that are available in the Sim Center portfolio, our focus today as, as we narrow in and drill into this topic is really around this physical testing area where we've got you know, the product Sim Center test lab, the software that many people attending are probably familiar, uh, have either used or seen in the past. And then Sim Center SCAS, our main hardware platform for doing digital data acquisition. So if you look at a pretty simple high level four bullet, if you will, uh, table of contents, I'm gonna to talk today about SimCenter status hardware, just in general, kind of position things up front. Then we're gonna get into some specific SimCenter status capabilities, and I put even and limitations, because in this discussion about high speed, high channel count, we're gonna push things to the limit, go up to the boundaries of what the hardware and software can do, and we wanna make sure it's clear as to what those limitations are and how you can get around those or extend that capability. And part of extending that capability is actually in the Sim Center test lab software world, we have a product, I'll say, that we sometimes call turbine testing. It's because it's the first area we deployed that type of configuration. That's why it's in quotes there. But we'll talk about what a turbine test or a high speed, high channel count hardware configuration would be, and then close with the things we do in the special side of software in the Sim Center test lab suite to make this high speed, high channel count testing possible. So with that, let's take a quick look at the SimCenter SCADIS hardware. So I'd like to at least have one slide in here where we actually talk about SimCenter SCADIS and the product name. Uh, there's been confusion in the market in the past where people think of SCADA, Supervisory Control Systems. But here we're talking about an, an old acronym that's going back 20, 30 plus years. Really it's Signal Conditioning and Data Acquisition System. And that's the platform, the hardware platform in the Sim Center world for digital data acquisition. And if we split that into some different categories, and you can see there's a number of different types of hardware on the screen here, there's really four specific pillars in which we would put this Sim Center SCADIS hardware. First on the left, as we consider personal testing, the Sim Center SCADIS XS. This is a small handheld unit. This is something that's about roughly the width of your hand. You can pick it up and carry it around put it in a large pocket, I'll say. You can use it autonomously, plug in a pair of binaural headphones that both measure and playback sound, uh, six or 12 channels, plus some other inputs like CAN bus, et cetera. Really intended to be like a field data acquisition unit you can go out and use very quickly and easily to do, I'd say, you know, even low to medium channel counts potentially. Then this next one here, the ruggedized field test in the SimCenter Status RS. This is a new word platform for us where we've really focused on making something that could be strapped to a bulldozer or bolted onto a train or put out into the field, IP resistant, uh, watertight plugs, et cetera. It can be in, left unattended, record for multiple days, but generally lower sample rates. And even though this could be considered a high channel count test system, we recently sold a set of like 2000 channels of Status RS for doing measurements for vibration related to seismic conditions, but of course that's very low sample rate. And today we're talking about higher sample rate, things that you would see in our SCADIS mobile or the SCADIS lab systems shown in these other two columns on the right. Both of these are more laboratory slash field testing positioned and generally sample at a much higher rate. Mostly today be talking about these two products Although I did include a fair bit of information about the SCADIS XS, which you might be a little surprised in a high speed, high channel count sense, but I think it'll be a little bit clearer as I go through some more slides. I did leave in one product slide from the previous one. I could have had one per, you know, the, the XS, the RS, et cetera. But I just wanted to point out that in something like the SCADIS Lab, SCADIS Mobile, 
you know, this happens to be a 19 inch rack mount frame versus the Scatus mobile Scatus recorders, which can be portable. They do have a battery built in. This 20 slot frame can have up to 480 channels of input. You know, of course, it's got built in signal conditioning, LEDs in the front panels, all the things you would expect from a modern data acquisition system. And the maximum sample rate per channel is a little over 200 kilohertz. And it's important whenever we say that in relation to SimCenter Center Scatus hardware, we're talking per channel, regardless of the number of channels measured. Our sample rate per channel does not go down based on adding more channels to the system or daisy chaining systems, which we'll get into a little bit later. However, saying that, you know, even though it's 24 bit, very, very wide spurious free dynamic range, there are limitations as to the total data we can put from a given front end to a single measurement computer. And I say it that way on purpose because this limitation, you'll see there's ways we can get beyond this in the case of Scatus Lab, 19 million samples per second throughput rate. That's total rate I can write to a host computer. But that's the one main thing we're gonna look at today in this discussion about high speed, high channel count is this total throughput rate I can get to, I'll say a computer in quotes. So a little bit of background just to make sure we're all on the same page here. So when I talk about throughput rate, the amount of data I can move through typically, let's say an ethernet cable plugged into a SimCenter status front end connected to a Windows computer, I'm gonna talk about that in mega samples per second. That's a data sample measured in time times the number of channels. So if I have one channel measured at a thousand samples per second, I'm at one thousandth of a mega sample per second. If I increase the one channel to 100 channels at that same rate, I'm at a tenth of one mega sample per second. And then as I add to that, do 100 channels at 10,000 samples per second, then I'm hitting the one mega sample per second data rate that I'd be transferring information between the front end and the host computer. Now, these are nice round numbers. Of course, generally most data acquisition systems have an analog to digital conversion clock that decimates the max rate by a factor of two or 2.5. So that depending on the exact hardware you have plugged in and the type of measurement mode, you'll see normal sample rates per channel or per channel group even I should say of say 512, 1024 Hertz, you know, 8192, 16384, and I kind of skipped through here. At the upper end, common rates you're gonna see for what I would consider quote unquote high speed our sample rates in 25,600, 51,200, or maybe 100 to up to 204.8 kilohertz sample rate. And if I multiply that out then for a real world sample rate, so I, if I had 92 channels measured at 204.8 kilohertz, that would be just under 19 mega samples per second. And if you remember on this previous slide, the limitation for a SCADIS lab the SimCenter SCADIS lab is 19 mega samples. So that puts the limit for the number of channels I can measure, it's 92, 93 right in the cusp for one front end connected to one computer. Now, now and then uh, people will say, but wait a minute, Jason, I was in my SimCenter test lab software and I couldn't pick 204.8 kilohertz. I, I, was, I had some other number, 151 kilohertz. That could be because you haven't checked the ADC sample frequency, which is configurable and changes based on the hardware you're connected to. So a little tip here for those of you in the audience that are current users of SimCenter Test Lab, when you're in your acquisition setup, in this case, it's a screenshot from SimCenter Test Lab signature acquisition, you might have to hit this more button, which opens a dialog box and lets you change the ADC sample frequency by default, many times it'll be at 102.4 or 100 kilohertz, meaning when you go to select the sample frequency up here, you can't go higher than that. So in order to get that max rate of 204.8, sometimes you need to hit the more button, pick the ADC sample frequency to be the 200 kilohertz, close that, and then you can pick that highest rate. Now I'm gonna make one other word of caution or comment here. As you may or may not know, I say that all of our hardware, quote unquote, can measure up to 200 kilohertz. That's kind of the max rate that we have on the vast majority of our inputs. We do have some modules, though, that are pretty popular. For instance, the V24, V24-2. 
that in a single card, instead of measuring eight channels at 204.8 kilohertz, we can measure 24 channels in the same total front end real estate, think of it that way, but we then divide by four the max sample rate where it might be 51.2 kilohertz for B24. And you have to be a little careful sometimes because let's presume you have a front end that has a mixture of eight channel input cards that can go to 200 kilohertz and the V24 style card that can only go to the 51.2. As long as you don't turn on or enable the V24 channels in your channel setup, you can go pick the ADC max sample rate of 204.8. And then you go make your measurements, set it to the highest sample rate and you're, you're good to go. But as soon as you enable a lower performance channel in the same system, it pulls all channels down to that lower sample frequency. It limits the max ADC frequency to the lowest performing card, which in the case of a V24 would be the 51.2 kilohertz. A little tip there if that's something of which you were unaware, and especially if you're a current customer and have a mixture of that type of hardware. So let's jump into a little bit more talking about capabilities and limitations, like I said earlier. So when we're talking about SimCenter SCADIS, most people in most instances take a computer and they plug it into a front end, SCADIS Lab, SCADIS Mobile, SCADIS Recorder, XS, doesn't matter, with a cable. Most commonly an Ethernet cable or UTP we'll call it sometimes, an unshielded twisted pair, or in the case of the XS, oftentimes that's a USB cable and you've got that connection, you've got some finite speed there. So that's just considered a normal single PC to single front end connection. Now it's also possible in most of our hardware, specifically the SCADIS Lab and SCADIS Mobile family, to mix multiple systems and connect them with a main secondary cable or a fiber optic cable. This was referred to as a main secondary. So in the case of this main secondary, I plug still one computer into one front end with the ethernet cable, but then I have in a ring topology, front end number one, front end number two, front end number three, front end number four. And these four systems all look like one big front end to the PC client over on the left. That single computer running SimCenter test lab. This is very nice if you've got a laboratory with multiple systems and you only need the really high channel count sometimes. It's optional on the SCADIS mobile slash recorder family. You have to add the main secondary module to the frame. It comes by default on all SCADIS lab chassis. One other important comment that's often forgotten, and it really only matters for very high frequency, very high channel count, but when you're using these fiber optic cables, to get the best accuracy as far as synchronization in time and phase alignment, you should use the same length fiber optic cable between all the systems. And there's a setting inside the SimCenter test lab software to tell the software the length of that fiber optic cable. And then it adjusts accordingly and gives you the maximum accuracy from a time and phase alignment standpoint through those multiple systems. Now, something that's less commonly known by our customers is the possibility to plug multiple front ends into a network switch and then plug the computer into that network switch. This gives you the possibility for two different types of arrangements. First, I could just use a connection tool I'll talk about in a moment where I say, hey computer, pick one of these two front ends to which you want to connect. You set that up ahead of time, you launch the software and you connect to only that one front end. Or you put it in what's called a, a main main configuration, meaning you have multiple systems being measured simultaneously through the network switch. And I can have this one computer connect to multiple front ends again as one large front end, similar to the main secondary of the fiber optic over here, but going through a network switch. The important difference is that this configuration actually has some higher throughput capabilities than this does over here. And it's because the connection speed in this case, I'm limited by this one SCADIS lab chassis in this graphic at that 19 mega samples per second coming back to the host computer. But with a granted very fast 10 gigabit network switch, this connection to the host computer can be faster than 19 mega samples. In fact, I can double that 
and get two front ends measuring at 19 mega samples each going to a single host computer through this network switch. Similarly, people are not always aware of with the SCADIS XS, I talked about that personal productivity small handheld front end. It is also possible if you have the network version of the SCADIS XS to plug these into a special network switch. I'll get back to why it's special a little bit later on and plug that into a single computer as well. So even though people think, ah, an XS, it's only 12 channels, but you can have multiples up to seven of these units, which gets you beyond 80 channels, which could be considered high channel count, high speed if they're at max sample rate in the XS scenario going through a network switch as well. Now, one other software tip, I mentioned this connection tool to configure that. Again, this is something that most people may be unaware as part of standard Simpson or test lab. In the tools folder for any given installation, there's this front end connection tool. By default, it's on this classic single connection, meaning I have one front end plugged into my one computer. It's just gonna go find that front end and make that connection when you launch the software and you'll be running the way that probably 95 plus percent of our customers do today. These other selections in the middle, the network single online connection. So this is the scenario that I mentioned where if I have the scenario like this, where I've got multiple front ends plugged into a network switch, I could pick any one of them to connect to my computer. So a single front end connected to my computer through a network switch, or this network multiple online means I want to have multiple front ends like this plugged into the network switch, but I want to have those act as one big front end to my single PC client. And that's this network multiple online connection. So just keep in mind that front end connection tool is required sometimes to do these configurations that we'll keep talking about later on. So now about those maximum throughput rates, you know, I mentioned some of those numbers already, but I put it into a table to kind of capture because it's important to have this sometimes to look back on like numbers of channels, maximums, et cetera. So the excess I included in the table, I wouldn't really give it a, a max throughput rate per se, but keep in mind that, of course, either the USB or Ethernet connection, I can, of course, do all six or 12 plus channels at their max sample rate of 51.2 kilohertz. I do say 12 plus because the excess has not only its analog inputs, but the possibility of a binaural head, CAN bus channels, the binaural headset, et cetera, that can be added on top of those 12 channels for an excess, depending on how you want to count that. And similarly, like I mentioned, if I have the SCX switch, the special network switch. Now there I have to use an ethernet connection and I need the version of the XS that has an N for network in the naming to allow this capability. But I could plug up to seven of those units into a network switch and then get 84 plus channels at that same 51.2 kilohertz. Now the other data in here, just maybe two things that are important to point out. First is that in O1 frame, so SCADIS Mobile O1 or SCADIS Recorder O1, has a max throughput of only 3.8 mega samples per second. But that's because it has a slightly slower network interface built in because it can't be combined with other systems because there is no room for a main secondary interface. And that network interface could handle any eight or 24 channel card because you can only put one card into this one slot frame. So it has the capability to, to handle that throughput no problem. But when you're talking anywhere from a two slot to a nine slot, SCADIS mobile recorder, it has a maximum throughput of 14 mega samples per second, a little lower than the SCADIS lab at 19 mega samples. But that says if you have say a nine slot frame with all eight channel cards in there, you could turn on all channels minus a few, because of course eight times nine would be 72. I can do 68 channels at the max two or 4.8 kilohertz sample rate. So not quite all 72 channels that you might have in a nine slot frame. Now, similarly, if you're unaware that the SCADIS recorder has the possibility to measure to a compact flashcard built in, either instead of or in parallel with a host computer. But as soon as you enable the built-in compact flashcard, the 14 mega samples drops to eight mega samples per second, which roughly halves the channel count from you can see here about 39. And I made a comment here about the possibility of measuring with or without parallel to the PC. Another little known fact that if you have a SCADIS recorder and a compact flash card, 
with specifically our test express software it is possible to simultaneously write to a host computer and to the compact flashcard simultaneously essentially to have data backup during the measurement when you're writing the raw time data although it is limited to eight mega samples per second and then lastly scatus lab i mentioned 19 mega samples from one scatus lab connection to a host computer that's 92 or 93 channels like i said right in the edge but if I plug two of those into a, a fast 10 gigabit network switch, I can then double that count and do 186 channels at the 204.8 kilohertz sample rate. Now let's talk a little bit about synchronization accuracy for both the XS and the Scatus Lab mobile recorder families. It is important to keep in mind that anytime you're using more than one measurement system, they have to be synchronized in some fashion and there, there will be trade-offs to the accuracy of the clock converting the analog signal into the digital time domain. So with the XS, because it does have built-in GPS, I could have separate XS systems where I'm locked onto a, a GPS satellite. I make sure that before I make the measurement, I measure separately, and then I can post-process the data and synchronize those files using the absolute time from GPS. However, in the best case scenario, that's in the 125 nanosecond range for jitter, or this is really accuracy between the time samples. The phase is noted as uncertain here because if you, if you get into this note down at the bottom, the best we can say in an ideal situation is maybe plus or minus one degree when you're using the GPS synchronization. But then if that could change during a measurement if, if the satellite's visible drop out or you, you lose some accuracy in the GPS signal. Now, the most accurate way I mentioned using the special network switch we have, and the reason it is special is that it has a built-in IEEE 1588 clock signal. So this clock signal is broadcast from the network switch to the excess systems that are plugged into it. And that signal is then used to set the ADC clock and synchronize it between all the systems up to seven that can be plugged into that network switch. This gives a very good 25 nanosecond accuracy which at 20 kilohertz gives you only a two tenths of a degree uh, potential phase difference so extremely accurate up to very high frequencies now interestingly enough this actually was surprised when i was looking up the data for this is that if you have multiple excess systems plugged into the network switch but you also turn on the gps to get an absolute time that actually reduces the accuracy a little bit so the accuracy between the systems it can be 25 nanoseconds, but if you include the GPS, it actually drops by half. I'd argue still very good, four tenths of a degree at 20 kilohertz, but not quite as good. Now let's take a look at the Scatus Lab mobile recorder line. I'll apologize for one thing here. I noticed that the data I had, now these phase misalignments are at 10 kilohertz, so not, not 20 kilohertz bandwidth like uh, we had in the previous excess slide, but it still gives you a, an idea that, so the best we can do with the main secondary being the fiber optic cable connection is 25 nanoseconds, about a tenth of a degree at 10 kilohertz. Now, if I'm using an iRig B synchronization source, and I'll come back to this later on in some hardware scenarios, if it's a digital iRig B signal, it's almost as good as our fiber optic built-in connection at 30 nanoseconds. And this is if I have an external digital iRig B signal. And this is what we use in some of our, what you heard later on, I call a, a turbine test setup. It is also possible though, if, if you think all the way back to where I had the slide where I showed two Scatus labs plugged into a network switch, plugged into one computer. And if I'm using those as one front end, I still need a way to synchronize the sample clocks, the ADC clocks between those two frames. And what we added was our own capability where we can create or generate the digital IRIG B signal from one of the systems and plug that into the second or third or fourth to do the clock synchronization. Our built-in digital IRIG is not quite as good as the external source signal. So that's a 40 nanosecond where I'm in, you know, what, 0.14 10 kilohertz phase misalignment. And then similarly, GNSS or GPS consideration in this case, similar to the excess that was 125 nanoseconds and 130 here. So I'm maybe half a degree at 10 kilohertz. And then lastly, if I go back 15, 20 years when we first incorporated the possibility to use an external clock synchronization signal, 
that used to be an analog IREC B signal. It was very common in aerospace that would have an IREC B time generator. It literally puts out a sine wave that's used to then synchronize multiple systems. But that analog style of signal, which is still around in some cases today, has much lower accuracy. You can see it's actually like two and a half degrees at 10 kilohertz with a 700 nanosecond potential difference. So now let's talk about some of the things that we have to do in, in a hardware sense, if I want to go beyond those capabilities we were just talking about, if I say, no, I need to have more than, what would you say, Jason, 186 channels at uh, 200 kilohertz. So that could be something like an outdoor turbine test. These tests can be hundreds of channels at maybe 100 kilohertz, a 200 kilohertz sample rate. They could have static channels. This could be easily into and above the 50 mega sample per second total throughput rate required. Many of these types of systems have to run for 24 seven or have alarming built in. They may have to have some monitoring for different customers. The way these tests are run, they're of course very expensive and mission critical. So they have to have a system that's robust, can be configured and is gonna essentially guarantee that the data will be saved and maintained. Similarly, uh, I've done some presentations in the past and we have a number of systems using the same architecture I'll talk about in our aeroacoustic wind tunnel setups. For instance, this is one at FKFS in Germany we've installed, if you look up the Honda Halo facility, the testing facility down, down in Ohio, they have more than 600 channels of microphones that are acquired simultaneously in that wind tunnel. Again, that number of channels at a high sample rate exceed what can be pushed through any given ethernet connection to a single computer. So how do we actually handle this? So we talked earlier a little bit about, okay, yeah, I could put multiple front ends through a 10 gig switch and plug it into a single computer. For sure, that's the easier thing to do. It's maybe an expensive network switch, but other than that, it's the exact same hardware you're probably using today. But then you've got this max channel count limitation of 186 at 204. Of course, if I have this, I can go from 186 channels to double that, so I'm, I'm well north of 300, but I'm still limited by this total, call it a 38 mega sample per second rate. If I have to go above that, like here's an example of systems we've deployed that have 640 channels at 100 plus kilohertz, you know, well north of 60 mega samples per second, and maybe they want to record for multiple days. So then instead of having multiple front ends, a network switch in one computer, we have, think of it as a, a, the gigabit network, the little box over here still exists, but then I have a control computer plugged into that network a computer hooked up to one front end plugged in, another computer hooked up to one front end plugged in, so acquisition node number one, number two, number three, et cetera. Now there's definitely some pros and cons to this. Of course, I mentioned the main main where I've just got multiple front ends going through one network switch. This is pretty fast and cost effective where I can double that 19 mega sample to get up, you know, I mean 186 channels at 200 kilohertz, that's a lot, right? Or, or let's say, you know, north of 350 channels uh, we're well beyond that. You know, we're talking about 370 plus at 100 kilohertz. But then I'm just recording to a single computer. There's a little bit more risk if something goes wrong that I only have the data up to the point where the recording stopped. One single large file through a standard SimCenter test lab installation. If I use this distributed approach, then I've got the possibility where now I've broken up my data into finite pieces where if, if something happens, somebody unplugs a system or a network cable breaks or whatever it is, I'm not going to lose all the data. I only lose maybe data from one of those acquisition nodes. I can split it up automatically into multiple pieces. I can have smaller chunks for analyzing. I can potentially run it continuously and then grab chunks of data that I want from that continuous data stream. But it is much more complicated to set up and much more costly because of the IT infrastructure. It's a very heavy IT centric, I guess I would call it, approach for this type of testing. If we look at this type of scenario graphically for systems that Siemens has deployed in the past, so this is for the, the turbine style test that I mentioned uh, and showed that picture in the previous slide. So I have hundreds and hundreds of channels coming from the object under test through multiple front ends. Every front end is plugged into an individual recording system, or in this case, even one of those goes to an alarming system. The alarming system is connected to the control client, essentially the, the test cell controller to shut down the test based on levels being measured. I've got my digital IREG B signal here that's used as the clock synchronization across all these systems. While these are measuring, the data is streamed through the recording systems live to multiple visualization systems where different people can view different channels. And then all, ultimately all the data is brought to a, a single data server or data storage location 
And the entire thing is orchestrated except this master control system starts and stops and controls everything. So if we drill a little bit deeper into that and talk about the software side as our last section. So what is this when I talk about this quote unquote turbine testing solution or TBT as we abbreviate it sometimes. So this is a setup that we have as a possibility in SimCenter Test Lab, and it's using the off-the-shelf software, but it's a customization that sits on top of standard Test Lab. But it's a package that allows me to do the standard setup calibration and troubleshooting, handle the IRIG-B absolute time annotation, set up long duration recording, figure out which systems are going to visualize which channels, and it keeps me fully independent from all, all other systems that are running on this potentially very complicated large test cell network, if you think of it that way. It also allows me to centralize all that data on the central server, like I said. So multiple recording systems streaming data to a single, I'll say, disk in quotes. Generally, these are RAID disk arrays, so there's very little chance of losing data on the computer itself. I can analyze that data during the test. I can view the data during the test. It, it can be backed up directly per day, per night, per test, at however the customer wants. And ultimately, if we look at this in a few screenshots, and I just kind of describe how this SimCenter test lab turbine testing solution works. And you'll notice some of these screenshots will say wind tunnel measurements because these are from, like I said, the aeroacoustic wind tunnel systems we have using this architecture. Some are from an actual outdoor true turbine test setup that we've done in the past as well. But here you can see that this recording manager is one screen that lets me determine, okay, which recording system am I using today? In this case, this one's configured with four possible computers. Are you going to record data to the server? Yes or no? Is everything ready to run? Is, is it up, up and going? Well, it's not yet. But as soon as I click the Start Recording System button, it goes through a process, launches the test lab recording session automatically on these remote systems. So there's no interaction from the operator in that case. It actually runs test lab on these recording computers, verifies it's good to go. You notice there are checks down here in the table that gives you how many channels are configured on, on a given system into different channel groups. What's the sample rate that's set? And then that based on those settings, what's the total data rate? What's the database that's gonna end up? What's the required space for a given session of, in this case, one hour total? And then what's the max recording time and space available? So you get all these indications that are set up automatically and read live from those systems day after day as the disk space gets used up or, or accumulated or backed up and freed back up, et cetera. And then ultimately you've got a global setup that, that says you're ready to go and then you can continue with the test. Now, the other optional things we can do in the SimCenter Turbine Test Suite, like I mentioned, the possibility for setting up uh, an alarming system. So I can have events that are part of the whole setup for things like detecting levels too high based on whatever, an accelerometer, a tachometer, calculations that can be done on the different recording systems that are then sent to typically the test cell control system in order to stop the test in case there's something that is beyond the limits that were set originally. In addition, we've got the possibility for this endurance mode recording. So one way to handle this is to essentially have the system on and running all the time. And it literally is writing data to the disks and think of it as this like circular first in first out buffer. When the hard drives get full, it just keeps flushing the oldest data and keeping the new files there. And these are normally done in chunks of a finite time that's set, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, it's configurable by the user. But essentially then, once somebody says, okay, record, then it saves that data to the central server for processing and viewing later on. Any of the data is viewable at any time, but in this endurance mode, those raw files are not stored by default throughout, throughout the entire recording. Unless this continuous recording mode is turned on, then we actually save all that data. And this can be set up to run for days and weeks to continuously to be able to look at information streaming in from the turbine test systems. The other important part of these type of systems is the possibility for users that are not running the system to be able to visualize the data that's being acquired at that time. I mean, this is real-time visualization so they can see things while the test is happening, whether it's that endurance mode or during a measurement, or during a condition that's being run. And again, similar to what we saw for the recording setup, there's a possibility just to turn on the different visualization systems you might need by the checkbox, starting those up, when that's done, the actual computers that are getting this secondary data stream coming through the recording systems then have all the standard test lab visualization possibilities available. So they can look at orders, time envelopes, 2D functions, spectrums, what, whatever calculations are possible in the displays, 
They can be seen along with the level indicators. You could use the different meter displays. All the things you would have in standard test lab are possible on these visualization systems. And you can also control, even if you have hundreds of channels in the total setup, a given visualization client could say, hey, I'm only concerned about these 30 channels because these are in the component that I'm here to monitor or test because I'm a vendor that's here checking out something that's on that turbine. So you can also control what channels you're actually seeing to make the, the overview easier to look at rather than having to sort through all 600 channels when you're doing that. And then lastly, as far as the overall measurement control, once I have configured my recording systems, those are all green and good to go. I've configured my visualization system, started those up so those end users can interact with the data while it's coming in live. Then I get, of course, a nice measurement control screen where I've got similar information to what we saw before. What's the space used on the systems? What's the remaining time? You know, is it hours, days, minutes? Is it measuring right now? If I get an error or I lose a signal or a clock synchronization signal or whatever it might be, I'd get a red status that shows up here. I can change my run names, record, start, stop, set up my endurance table, et cetera. So I've got a, a one screen control where I have an operator that's running in anywhere from two, three, four, six, eight, ten computers measuring simultaneously all at very high sample rates, very high channel counts and orchestrating the whole measurement itself. So that pretty much sums it up. If we kind of look at a little bit of an overview of the things we talked about today, the SimCenter SCADIS hardware, you have to be aware of the max throughput rate that's available. Depending on the hardware type for the one slot frames, like I said, could be as low as 3.8 mega samples per second. If you combine multiple systems through a high speed network switch, you can get up in the range of 38 mega samples per second. So 186 channels at max sample rate of 200.8 kilohertz. Front end connections could be by a single PC, like shown down here in the bottom left, a main secondary where I've got the fiber optic cables or a main main shown like this graphic in the upper right. But you should also always be at least aware of the time and phase accuracy for the different ways of synchronizing, whether that's GPS, the fiber optic cables, through the network switch, IRIG B, analog or digital, et cetera. And then lastly, in the SimCenter software side, you know, a single PC client, like I said, can handle up to close to 200 channels at maximum sample rate. But then you're going to get one giant time file, handle that through the one client, which in a lot of cases works great and gives people that flexibility when they have to do that. But for a very high channel count, higher than the 186, or you've got to do multiple days or have alarming built in or continuous data streaming, that's when we get into uh, what I call the turbine test software for SimCenter Test Lab that allows these other things possible on top of standard test lab software. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time.